Good afternoon, everyone. So as Marco just said, I will um, present a few slides on uh, single object spectroscopy with uh, the NeoSpec instrument. And unlike, uh, oh, thanks, all the uh, other near infrared instruments, uh, we actually have apertures in the, ah, oh, great, I shouldn't put <coughs> that button, I guess. <laughs> is, that, is that relevant for me or is? <laughs> If I, if I can find the mouse, ooh. No, I can't. Put your mouse on top of it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I try. <clears throat> so we try again. I only have 50 slides or so, so it should be fine. Um, so Nierspec, Torsten already gave a nice introduction to Nierspec uh, this morning. So this is basically just a reminder that uh, Nierspec is a, is a complex instrument and we offer basically four observing modes. So we have, we have the uh, multi-object spectroscopy that Torsten talked about this morning. We have an integral field unit, uh, so we can do integral field spectroscopy. And uh, Nora will present that on, um, on Wednesday, so tomorrow. And then we have uh, the fixed lit spectroscopy and uh, also bright object uh, time series. And um, those two modes uh, utilize the spec slits. So we have uh, basically five slits or apertures that are supported, or we have those for the fixed slit spectroscopy, uh, three 200 milli arc second wide slits, one uh, 400 milli arc second wide slit, and then a square aperture with 1.6 by 1.6 arc seconds. Um, so the other, the uh, narrower slits are roughly uh, three, three and a half uh, arc seconds high. And then for, multi, uh, for, for bright object time series, we, um, we will use the, the square aperture. And uh, all those basically modes and, uh, have in common that uh, we have six gratings and, and a prism available as dispersers. There's also a mirror for target acquisition, as Torsten uh, told us this morning already. And then uh, light is detected by this uh, focal plane assembly that consists of two uh, SCAs, relatively closely spaced. And um, uh, yeah, uh, from uh, sensitive from about 0.6 to 5.3 micron um, and to 100 milli arc second on the sky, pixel size, roughly. Then again, for the, uh, different for the dispersers, uh, so basically, uh, the, the six gratings are, come, come in pairs of three. So we have three medium and three high resolution gratings. The wavelengths coverages are uh, up here. The topmost bar is for the prism, which basically covers 0.6 to 5.3 in, in one, uh, one setup. The resolution for the gratings are given here, and the prism is down here. So medium resolution is, about, is around 1,000. Uh, higher, what we call high resolution is around uh, 2,700, 3,000, and then the prism varies from um, around 30, around 1.2 micron to uh, 300 or so at five microns. Then the um, aperture plane, now basically projection, projecting the, uh, the aperture plane where the MSA are and the fixed slits are onto the detectors, which are uh, these uh, red rectangles here. That's how it looked like. And then in the center, you have the fixed slits with their names that have been uh, given to them. So uh, you see that four of the fixed slits are on the left-hand side, basically. Uh, yeah, on the left-hand side, there's one slit, which is basically a backup. I uh, come to that uh, later on, on the other side. And if you, if you do now look at real data, basically shining light through these uh, apertures in imaging mode, that is what you will see. Uh, it's probably hard to see <laughs> from the back uh, with the dark colors here, but you have the images of the, of the slits here. You have the image of the uh, slit on the right-hand side here, and you can also maybe make out, uh, out um, the virtual or the, the slits of the IFU that was opened for this observation here, but we don't talk about the IFU. And then if you put in a disperser instead, so uh, for example, a high-resolution uh, grating, you will see something like this. So the uh, light is dispersed in this direction, Wavelength increasing to the right, uh, and you also see here the detector gap. So there's uh, some missing wavelength in, in, in between here. And for the prism, things look a bit uh, different. Oh, sorry, yeah, fixed lit spectra, just said that. For the prism, uh, spectra are much shorter, so everything 
uh, for the fixed slits, unlike for the MOS, where you can have uh, spectra that fall into the gap in principle, uh, all the spectra um, fall on, on one detector. And the same is true actually for the medium resolution gratings. Uh, the, the full spectrum will, will fall into one of the two detectors. And you see here, uh, this is basically this, this backup slit, which is uh, only there in case uh, something bad should happen and we should lose one SCA uh, here on the left hand side, then you can still do fixed slit spect spectroscopy on the other side. So then for the fixed slit observing, and this is a busy chart, so I try to walk uh, you through slowly. So as I said, we have five slits available, one of which is a backup. And um, we can actually read the detector when you, when you try, uh, when, when, you, when you get uh, observations with, uh, uh, with, a fixed, with, with an object in the fixed slit. Uh, we can read the detector um, uh, in different modes. So traditional, I mean, full frame mode is supported where you basically, basically read the full detector. And the benefit of having that is that uh, it also supports this uh, IR square mode with the improved reference sampling and subtraction that Marco talked about yesterday, which gives you a better total noise in principle. And yes, of course, we cover the, full, the, the fixed slit spectra and actually regions of the MOS as well. Then there are smaller subarrays that uh, can be used, for example, if, if your sources are brighter and saturation might be an issue uh, or maybe data volume. So there's uh, an all slit uh, subarray which, as the name maybe implies, actually covers, covers all the uh, spectra from the fixed slits. So it's roughly this, this size here. And um, then there are dedicated subarrays, uh, 64 by 248 pixels per detector, that cover the, the slits that you select uh, to put your source in. And then, as, as for ground based uh, fixed slit observing, basically, you, you have a um, range of available knots and dither patterns. So you can uh, do either no knot if you, if you choose to uh, basically deal with the background on, on, on your spectral level then, or you can uh, take a two or three or five point knot. Uh, those are depicted here uh, along the slit and uh, basically do a one-to-one -one, uh, subtraction so to get rid of the background for compact sources at least. Then there are additional dithers around those knots for sub-pixel sampling. I won't go into the details here. And um, you also have the, uh, the um, yeah, possibility to, to take, basically you choose both slits, both 200 uh, A slits on the, on the left-hand side, and those are designed basically here. The, the, the distance between those slits is just that you basically recover the wavelength gap here. So if you're taking high-resolution spectra in both slits, you have no missing wavelength uh, in between. Uh, and as I said before, we have all dispersers, dispersers available, and you can uh, s select um, multiple or all in, in your observing template. I will just briefly show the template later. And there will also be, I mean, before you can actually observe, you need to or take spectra, you will need to do a target acquisition. So this is how the current APT template for the fixed lid observing look like. looks like. You uh, select your instrument, in this case NearSpec, then the fixed lid spectroscopy, where you have to give a target. And then basically it's, uh, you select a slit, a subarray, uh, either pattern or not patterns. And um, then you add, add the spectral configurations here, which you observe. And you can have many here if you want. Um, and all those, the knots and dither patterns and so on will be repeated for, for all those uh, activities, for all those gratings or dispersers. Then briefly for target acquisition, at the moment uh, what is foreseen, let's say, to, to be supported is the so-called standard TA, which is uh, quite complex, as, as uh, Thorsten showed us this morning. So you will have a set of reference, uh, reference stars and you can actually um, use those to, to put an object into any aperture then. Uh, and the uh, second way of, of doing target acquisitions is actually using the, um, the uh, large importation max uh, uh, aperture, the 1.6 arc second square aperture. And you put either your science target or a reference target there and then uh, offset basically to the, to the aperture that you want or the slits that you want to use. And also for, for this, uh, for this TA, I mean, we have uh, three different target acquisition filters available, different readout patterns. Um, I won't go into the detail here, but, but there will be some, uh, I think, tools also available to, to help basically the observer select the right, uh, to make the right choice there for target acquisition. Um, then, coming back to the slits and how they look, actually, when you take uh, flat field data, they, they have uh, the, the 200 and mil, 400 milli arc second wide slits, uh, show some stripiness in the order of. Uh, 20%. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, that when I say 200 milliarc second uh, projected on the sky, it, it means uh, 
basically 80 microns uh, wide, so like the shutters physically, and unfortunately the, um, the edges are not uh, as clear cut as, as uh, they should have been or as we, as we would have liked them. So uh, this is basically what you get. Nora pro produced those uh, slip profiles here. So there are some uh, variations basically in the throughput of those slits to uh, most, mostly that flat fields out. This is basically a flat field that was uh, created um, uh, from CV3 test data. And um, also the nodding patterns that will be available basically, we will try to uh, minimize nodding to these narrower regions. And then for point sources, we, have, we will have slit losses and also they will depend on the, um, on the width of your slit. Uh, it is planned that we, we will calibrate basically the provided um, nodding and, and, and sub positions. Uh, so that should be taken care of. Then finally, sensitivity. I just so show here the sensitivities, again, roughly 10,000 seconds uh, through one of the A200 slits uh, for continuum sources. And yeah, medium resolution here. It's, it's basically the same as uh, what Thorsten just showed. The slits are the same size. And um, so the first order, it's, it's very, it's basically similar. Uh, so you go down to roughly one micro or so uh, per spectral pixel huh, in the, for the medium resolution gratings. Then uh, bright object time series observing. So, so here, um, uh, sensitivity is not so much of an issue, it's more stability. You want to have a, basically you want to follow a source over time, get spectra of that source, and uh, you want to get the best uh, radiometric stability. So this is for observing exoplanet host stars, for example, doing transit eclipse spectroscopy. Uh, so the S1600 is good for this because it's big enough that your slit losses uh, and radiometric variations due to telescope drift and jitter um, are minimized while still having uh, basically no background and uh, so also no uh, overlap from adjacent sources and these things. Um, for these, you can only have one activity, which is in so one setup, basically. And, um, but uh, what we also have, uh, in contrast to other observing modes, is that this uh, 10,000 second exposure time limit, which is imposed otherwise, so that the um, t observatory is able to move its high-gain antenna to point back to Earth, is, is lifted. So, I mean, the antenna will still move, it has to, but, uh, you will just integrate through it. And that is, that is better in terms of detector stability uh, so that the, you don't break the exposure, you just keep integrating, integrating, integrating. There are a range of subarrays available for this uh, mode and aperture specifically. I mean, actually the same kind of subarrays are available for this aperture in the fixed lit template as well. And um, the one I will, well, uh, basically the, uh, there's one that will cover the full wavelength range of the grating. Um, and there's also one that covers the full, that will cover the full reference range, so the prism, prism, and then there are some smaller ones where you basically trade shorter frame time, uh, times, which mean brighter sources uh, with wavelength coverage. And, um, and then again for TA, uh, we will have the uh, probably two methods: so the wide aperture as for the fixed lids, and also probably the uh, verify only or point and shoot uh, TA method, where you just blindly put your object into the slit because the slit is uh, wide enough. Then how does data look like? Two examples here, point source through, the, through this aperture uh, with the observed as a prism, 32 by 50, 12 subarray. So this is basically then how a continuum spectrum, we have some absorption feature here, uh, looks like. And then for the high resolution grading, an example here, 32 by 248, uh, you see there's some curvature in the trace, uh, but you still get the full, um, the full spectrum plus uh, basically background uh, on, on both detectors then. And of course there's a wavelength gap here. And in this case you, you cannot recover it because there's only one slit and there's no way to dither. Uh, then for this mode, uh, what is important is, are the brightness limits. So um, basically here what I show is for the different dispersers, grating, I, I won't do much detail in this, uh, you will see in the, in the slides, is um, Basically, it's different gratings, high resolution solid, uh, medium resolution dashed, the prism is in black, and uh, everything below this line, below those line means that it should be observable uh, without saturation anywhere in the band with one group, so very short integrations. And um, again, this is our current best guess. There's some uncertainty on that. If you zoom in into the upper part where only the gratings are show, shown, um, again, this disclaimer here, current best guess, you will see that uh, most of the um, 
sources as of, I think this is uh, June this year, uh, below the uh, projected uh, saturation limit. So you will be able to observe them uh, with near spec. Then for what, uh, regarding sensitivity, um, the faint case is not so interesting for this, uh, uh, the faint yeah, end is not so interesting for this bright object time series. It's more like the bright end. So if you are close to these lines here, what kind of signal to noise can you achieve? And then um, this is one example uh, for, for an M4V, uh, M4 uh, host star, roughly 10, uh, 10th magnitude in J, uh, J band, 3200 second transit time. And uh, observed with a clear prism, with a 32 by 512 subarray. And there, there are two curves here because uh, basically what you can do is uh, sometimes you can trade uh, basically number of groups and the signal to noise in one spectral range whereas there's early saturation um, and signal to noise in another. And that's exactly what's happening here. So the, the light gray curve is reading only one group and um, getting the, the spectrum there. And then from the simulations we get uh, in the order of uh, 20,000 uh, signal to noise, uh, differential signal in, measured inside the transit. So basically 50 ppm here at the peak, uh, lower of course where, where the SED falls off. And then if you do two groups, you, you will still, you will saturate basically this region here before the second read. So you can only use the first group and your efficiency goes down because your integration gets longer, but your photon collection time doesn't. But you increase um, signal noise in, in the uh, other spectral ranges because your uh, efficiency goes up. You have more reads uh, and less dead time basically between uh, integrations relatively. And then to um, wrap it up. So summary, near spec offers uh, five fixed slits. So 200 milli second wide, like the, uh, like the, basically like the shutters in the, in the MSA for multi-object spectroscopy. We have one 400 milli second slit and uh, 1,600 milli second uh, wide aperture, square aperture. And all the dispersers are available. Prism 0 0.6 to 5, uh, 0.3 micron and, and the uh, three medium and high resolution gratings in between. Um, yeah, the slits provide very high contrast. There's no issue with the uh, background from failed open shutters or uh, in, let's, uh, through, uh, through print or limited contrast from the, from the MSA. Uh, excellent sensitivity and um, there are a uh, number of predefined knots and dithers available. And then we also have a dedicated aperture, uh, which is one of this, uh, which is the same here, for, for the bright object time series observations. So with, which will provide the highest, uh, for near spec at least, the highest uh, radiometric stability uh, to enable observations of transiting uh, or eclipsing uh, exoplanets. Thank you.